Diego, uh, you have you put some yeast cells in a in a, in a syringe, and you put a freeze buffer, and you put a lot of oxygen, and so you put it into an electro blood gas machine, and you will see the hematocrit, the, I'm sorry, the oxygen tension, PaO PO2 going down, 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 down. They consume all the oxygen until it's gone, but all zero. So then we put a little bit of blood from a normal person. And suppose we have a hematocrit of 43%. So then you see that this, this is the curve, it comes down, but then it starts going like this. And this, if you look at it from one side, is the oxygen dissociation curve. And this area is all the arterial oxygen content that is captured by the hemoglobin. But if you have a patient like this who has a hematocrit of 71%, when we do this test, you will see that instead of going down, it keeps going like this, this, like this, like this, like this. The, all the oxygen is consumed. So this, all this area is the amount of oxygen that hemoglobin can capture because that's the compensation mechanism, because the organism adapts by increasing the hemoglobin. And when we were told there is no chronic mountain sickness or polyerythrocytemia in Tibet, we were invited in a conference, and as we arrived at the airport, we landed, they put us this, uh, this scarf that they do as a welcome scarf in Lhasa, in Tibet, and he immediately found one of the drummers that was cyanotic, very typical chronic mountain sickness type of thing. And he's, you see, he's, he's working up there and, and, and uh, normal. He's a musician. So he said, take a photo, please. They said, there's no chronic mountain sickness here. We arrive in the airport and look at the first guy I see is. <laughs> so there's the, then we went shopping in Las Tibet for some clothes for the girls, my daughters, and they also found, we, he also found another young man, and you see he's a Tibetan, you look at his, his uh, physiognomy, he's cyanotic, with typical, I said, another picture please. So, so he threw away this idea that in Tibetans don't have polyurethane, because they have it, because they have lung diseases. Maybe he was smoking, or, they, or that he had lung disease, or he had thromboembolism, or other these problems. And of course, he has adapted, and he lives there and works there as anybody would. So, so he defined polyrhythmia as a found in residents at high altitude with some abnormal pulmonary function, increased chant. In other words, some of the blood does not get oxygenated when it passes through the lung, and it goes to to the circulation, so that's a shunt, so it lowers the oxygen tension. Then impaired diffusion, for instance, from somebody that has worked in a mine or is working as a, uh, as a laborer that's breathing a lot of dust, so they, there's a diffusion impairment. Uneven ventilation and perfusion, that means certain areas of the lung don't ventilate very well. You know, and that can be due to several factors, of course, and also hypoventilation, which is low, but if the respiratory breathes less, then of course you have less oxygen in the, in the, in the pneumodynamic pump. So these are sequelae of diseases of reverse, reverse idiopathic energies. These lead to a sustained and variable low oxygen saturation and cyanosis, giving rise to pulmonary hypertension and polyrhythmia as compensatory mechanisms of adaptation, adaptation of the disease under chronic hypoxic conditions. The symptoms and signs are aggravated on a sense. Of course, if you take these men higher, then you will have more, more, more hypoxia, their hematocrit will go up higher, and are reversible by the set to sea level or by increasing the inspired oxygen tension. In other words, if you give them permanent oxygen, but they have to live with these machines, with oxygen, and it's best to let them do it the physiological way, increase their red cells and, uh, and perform very well. So I wanted to, this is the last part, but one of my papers is called Hypoventilation in Chronic Mountain Sickness, 
an energy saving mechanism. Because why do these patients hypoventilate? It can be a primary respiratory disorder, of course. You know? But let's see. During exercise, there is an increase in ventilation in cardiac pump in order to supply the increased amount of oxygen to the tissues. If any of you runs, you start breathing more, your heart starts beating because you need more oxygen. The typical response of acute exposure to hypoxia is hyperventilation. When you go up to La Paz, you hyperventilate. Patients with increased polycythemia or polyrhythmia is the right terminology, at high altitude, hypoventilate and have a low arterial oxygen saturation at rest. So I decided to test these guys. I took 17 people, they were younger, of course, 19 is a weight. Their hematocrit was 50%, just like mine. 19 men. And then I took this polyerythrocytemia patients, they were 13. You see, they were older, 54.8. Their weight was a little higher and their hematocrit average was 72%. And we measured many variables, electrocardiogram ventilation, and tidal O2, and tidal CO2, uh, expired oxygen, expired carbon dioxide, and pulse oximetry, and we calculated oxygen consumption, carbon dioxide production, and respiratory causes. And the ventilation you see in normal people, in this normal group, was 9.54 liters per minute. That's a normal ventilation for that normal room. That's more or less what I would breathe in my past. And these patients with polyerythrocytemia had a lower ventilation, but it was not very significant. So you can see it's, it's, it's lower, but it's not statistically significant. But anyway, both groups were, were performed in a USFA modified exercise protocol similar to track protocol to the Bruce protocol with intercranial gradient in miles per hour during three minutes each stage. They were running and we put electrodes and, and breathing equipment and all that in saturation. And what I want to show you here is the, the thin red line is the saturation pulse oximetry. We told you it was 91 to start with in La Paz. The thick lines is the patients with polyerythrocytemia. You see they have lower saturation, 85 was the, in this case, I mean 87. And so, when we put them through different stages, the, the blue lines are the normal ventilation. This is pulse, this is the pulse, heart rate, and this is the ventilation the, of normals. The thicker ones are the polyerythrocytemic ones. So you see, when we put them to do exercises, we show that the saturation drops quite a bit here, the ventilation is higher than in the uh, normal people, and then, the, I'm sorry, the heart rate, and the ventilation is pretty similar at the beginning, but then they increase more. So what does this mean? The conclusion from this was that, were that the patients with polyerythrocytemia at high altitude hypoventilate at rest and show significant degrees of saturation when they are doing exercise. During exercise, they also have a significant increase of saturation, although their ventilation and cardiac frequency is higher in the first four stages of exercise compared to normal. The low saturation during exercise shows that even though the hemodynamic and hemodynamic pumps are working well above that of the normal control group, there is a deficiency in the hemodynamic pump, which is due to pulmonary insufficiency better arterial chance and uneven ventilation. In other words, when you put them to run, they breathe more, but they cannot sustain the saturation and it drops down more. Hence, it is inferred that hypoventilation with low arterial oxygen content at rest is an energy saving mechanism. You see, breathing is work, it's like running. You know, if you walk every day, you use certain muscles. If you run every day, you use the same muscle, but in more intensity. But that has an energy cost, obviously. And so the organism tends, we don't go around running all the time. We, we walk, because that's an energy-saving mechanism to achieve distances, okay? 
So what happens here, we infer that hypoventilation with lower tail content at rest is an energy saving mechanism. And so this is possible thanks to an increase in the number of red blood cells that allows the involved cardiorespiratory muscles of both pumps to consume the least amount of energy required. So it turns out that we have concluded that part of this hypoventilation is probably due to the fact that the organism finds it easier to increase red cells because the oxygen transport is carried out efficiently with an increase of red blood cells and thereby reducing the work of both pumps. And what about the concept of loss of adaptation? You know, the uh, Peruvians pointed out that this is a loss of adaptation. These patients have lost their adaptation, and so since the Tibetans have low saturation and these guys have very high, now we look for the genes of this disease that they have lost adaptation. My father said, loss of adaptation? It's ridiculous. You can't live with loss. If you lose adaptation, you die. You don't live many years with the loss of adaptation. Did you capture that idea? This is very important. You see, you are all adapted. We are all adapted because life is about adaptation. Survival is about adaptation. If you lose adaptation, you don't continue living, you die. So he criticized this very strongly and, and, and he got into trouble because many said, oh, wait a minute, there's loss of adaptation. So, our faith, so he put this favorite photo after a meeting at the Third World Congress of Mountain Medicine and Hypophysiology in Japan. And he said, this is in Matsumoto. <clears throat> this is my father doing a, a, a su, su, sumo fight with Carlos Monge, the, the son of the, man, the doctor that talked about loss of adaptation in Peru. This is her assistant, his assistant. This is Michiro Nakashima, a very good scientist from Japan. And I am there, and you see I have black hair there. <laughs> I was younger. And so my father put this photo to say, they propose loss of adaptation, and I propose adaptation of diseases. And you know, I think he's right. Not because he's my father, because we see this with my daughter, who is a physician, and she has observed. And if you come to work with us, and you treat these patients, we are 100% sure that they are adapting within their disease. So many of the multi-million dollars investments now searching for this gene of this lost adaptation patients is going down the drain because they are finding this disease they find this gene this gene this gene this gene and then the, the list they showed i just saw a french guy talk about the genes they found in these patients and it was such a labyrinth of genes that he was lost and by the way Nino, Professor Nino, said that they found that children with autism have, each child has a different gene change. So you cannot find a gene, one gene change, and say, oh, this is autism. No. And he says, of all the autism kids we have tested, each one had a different gene mutation. So it's very complex. And so this is the reason we are proposing these concepts that there is no loss of adaptation. So the conclusion is there is no loss of adaptation in polyantrocytemia, previously known as chronic mountain sickness, and my father wrote this sentence. And this sentence now lies next to his ashes in the high altitude museum that Natalia has created, my daughter Natalia in the city of La Paz, and Professor Kusal Das has visited and we have his ashes, and below his ashes is this sentence that is fundamental. The organic systems of human beings and all other species tend to adapt to any environmental change and circumstance within an optimal period of time and never tend towards regression, which would be loss of adaptation, that we would inevitably lead to death. So that is a very important concept because we are permanent. When you get married, you have to adapt to your husband or your wife. If you don't adapt, bad. <laughs> and there is no loss of adaptation. You can't live without no adaptation with your wife or your husband. 
So this is the man whom I always express my admiration. He was named the guru of the mountain in Bangalore, India at St. John's University in November 2009. And my gratitude in life and true eternity today. This is, I wish to thank, first of all, my father, because he's the promoter of all these ideas on which we are building up with Natalia. This is Natalia. This is Rafaela, my other daughter, that is my assistant also and worked with us at our institution. This is Lucrecia de is my wife. And these other people are the people. This is my mother. This is my brother. This is my sister. This brother is all, my mother was a nutritionist. My brother, younger brother, medical doctor. My uh, younger sister is a biotechnologist. Uh, my older sister is also a medical doctor. This is my nephew, who is a medical doctor. And these are medical students that were helping most of the time, and all the members and people of our institute. So that's all I have to show you now. the outset, I thank you, sir, for the lucid talk, Thanks. the Thanks. chronic mountain sickness, what we think, what happens is different at different parts, high altitude and low altitude. So just, what is your experience about the core pulmonary, sir, acute pulmonary embolism or chronic core pulmonary in these mountain sickness patients? Very important. Very important. See? Your question is very important because, as you know, the pulmonary thromboembolism sometimes remains unnoticed. They can have a little bit of pain, they, maybe they have a little bit of sputum, but most of the time, if it's micropulmonary thromboembolism, nothing will show. If it's a major clot, of course, you will have a collapse, you know, very serious. In fact, the professor. But this happens, of course, at sea level, just like at high altitude. The professors that work with me at the University of Copenhagen, Professor Paul Eric Powlett, he was a great physiologist. We dedicated the last uh, symposium to him. He was uh, one day playing golf in Copenhagen. He was a very sporty man. And suddenly, he felt this, this thing, and he fell down. Boom. And he is in the hills all alone playing golf. And so, and he's short of breath, so he tried to yell and he couldn't yell. And so he picked up his golf club and went like this. And somebody, fortunately, was playing golf, saw it, and they found it. He had a major thromboembolism, pulmonary thromboembolism. And this is at sea level. And of course, he survived that. He was hospitalized, they gave him anticoagulation therapy, and so on. Uh, and they really used enzymes, you know, streptokinase, urokinase, I think it was. And he really he evolved, and after that, I met him. So that type of problems we have also at Sida. But I am I even under the impression that we have less thromboembolism than at Sida. Somehow, there is a compensation, even though we have thicker blood, we have a less trauma. Any questions from the audience? Please feel free to answer. ask. Please. I think the... Just introduce yourself. My name is Pooja and uh, I'm a medicine PG from the Department of Medicine. So, like you said, the the problem of thromboembolism is probably less at your altitude, is probably because the, there is higher degree of vasodilatation. So viscosity in itself is not a problem. So higher levels of nitric oxide will cause a lot of vasodilatation in your system. So viscosity will never be an issue at that level, I think. I mean, that's what I think. Congratulations to the school for having students that think like that. I'm lucky enough to have the postgraduates in my department. Uh, quality postgraduates. Very good.
Any other question? Please feel free. Don't. No, it doesn't matter. If, if, don't be shy. Don't inhibit yourself from speaking. Do it. It's good. I hope you have enjoyed the, the talk. It's a different from what you see. But you know what? It's my daughter, Natalia. I'll give you a few words. Please. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. For us, it is a real privilege to be here. We have seen wonderful things. We are very happy and honored to be able to show you, us, show you our work. You see, everything we do in life is related to several factors. So what we are showing here seems completely out of your reach. Many of you must be thinking, oh, but I don't work at high altitude, so I don't see the point of this, you know? But it has total relationship to what you do here. And this is what we found here by coming. We are very grateful because Thanks to the people who brought us here, we were able to come and compare. So these that we see here, we also see here. Here's here that we showed you. We also see here, but in another level. So what we are doing by sharing, by working, every one of us in our areas, is to contribute a little bit to the understanding of the world. Well, what I'm talking right now might sound completely philosophical. You know, you might be thinking, why are we talking about this? I mean, I'm going to be talking about this. Because this is what unites us as a society. We come from the other side of the world. I think it's exactly the other side of the world. But I can, but I can assure you, I, I would have to bring um, the geography and everything. Because geography has to do with this. Nine hours. I, nine hours. But the thing is that it's nine hours. And I live at high altitude. Here you live. In, at the low altitudes. You see, us who live up there, we eat all kinds of foods, including meat. You eat all kinds of other things that we're learning from, okay? So the beautiful thing is that when we share, then we can have the understanding of the other side of the coin. What are the other variables that are taking place? This is important for us because we are trying to solve people's lives. So supposedly most people who are here, who see a patient, are trying to bring balance back to this patient. This is what we look for. So for this purpose, we learn how things work, what treatments you have, what diseases are in the environment, what quality of soil we have, what quality of air we have. Because if we don't understand the causes of things, we can probably not understand how we're going to fix this thing. So, Literally, what we're doing is, it's, I could speak a lot, but I know you have many things to do, so do we. We have a problem, we have to follow. But it's just to give you an understanding of why this is important to you as well. It's important that you, every time you find something new, you try to understand this. You see the concepts behind this. And then you will see how this is useful in your life, okay? You are very much welcome to come visit us in Bolivia. Hopefully we will continue exchanging. Thank you so much for everything. And we, if you have any other questions, please do so, because we are here to share. Uh, first of all, I'd like to really give thanks to uh, Professor Russo for excellent talk in a very simple way and keeping the time in the schedule in the right way. Really. And there are a very interesting part of the people who stayed in the high altitude. Even when I was first time exposed to Bolivia and La Paz, and I understand that there are quite different of the own kinds. The first thing I realized is that I lost the appetite. That was my first effect in rather than any other, which actually I was prepared for mentally, but I didn't have that problem. But appetite was great enough. This was one of the things I need, that adaptation pathway. Uh, sickness among the sick, chronic mountain sickness. Actually, it may be acute, because it is an acute mountain sickness, because it will adjust after some time. But yeah, I saw it in after a few days, I adjusted. And I got the appetite a little down. So this is one thing I have observed. 
Second thing I just want to ask you, that certain studies in Indian Himalayan altitude, which is exactly like your Andes mountain of your place, like one of the example is the Ladakh in the Leh. Yes. The altitude of Leh is 3,510 meters, exactly like you. Exactly. exactly like you. But the very interesting, the adaptive pathways are not saying. So specifically, when they started in recently, last two weeks back, I was in Delhi, so conducting a PhD examination in all these medical sciences. And this is what I found that it is a specific gene uh, which they evaluated there and they cross match with some of the and this the Peruvian gene, they found that adopting pathways, certain genes are missing in Ladakh population. Lay. Lada, yeah, lay. And that's the reason they say that adaptation in lay is little critical as compared to the Andes mountain. It's critical? Yeah, it's a little difficult. difficult. Yeah. For that reason, even they say that the Defense Institute of Physiology and Allied Science in Delhi. They are giving soldiers to train for this, for going this one, and they found exactly reverse effect. They found the soldiers who are being trained adequately in aerobic parts to adapt in high altitude in the CHN and I, they are more easily succumb and easily actually been non-adapted, and they have to brought back to them. Comparison to the people, the soldiers who are actually not trained for that one. That exercise they have not done. So this was a unique part of that in the other areas the defense research has found it in and just included. And this is actually part of that one. I want to ask you, such thing because you have the zone in the Amazon zone, where is the low and then high altitude. Do you have found that the soul, the people adaptation, it differs who are being prepared mentally? Or physically, they get better at it or not? Very good question. You see, one third of uh, uh, Bolivia is tropical lands because we have Amazon. Very similar palm trees, uh, coconuts, very similar. Monkeys, no elephants. <laughs> we don't have elephants. So, these people come to La Paz. Okay. Now, of course, when they come acutely to the past, they also have headaches, so they don't like to come. You know, headache, uh, acute mountain sickness, you know, uh, anorexia, you know, no, no, no appetite. And sometimes vomiting before it could evolve to more serious condition. About one in four people feel some kind of headache when they come. So they don't like to come. But if they come and they stay there, and I have many, many, we have many people that have come from this lowlands, and I am sure most of you would adapt perfectly well. Now, it has a time frame. It's also the quality of the food. The food is important for every place. You know, my hair is normally not this color in La Paz. But here it's a little more yellow because of the spices of the food, you know? I've changed, I look at myself, oh, I'm looking different. I'm becoming blonde here. <laughs> so I have to take some more spices home so I become blonde in La Paz. So, uh, so we have to adapt. And now some people, we, we say that high altitude is a test of cardiopulmonary fitness. In fact, some people that you, have, you, you run tests here, you won't find anything. You take them to La Paz, we run tests there, and we find that some alterations in their heart, a communication, some kind of alteration in the ventilations or respiratory center, so it becomes more evident. Now, you guys, every time I...